All right, everybody, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Welcome to week number five. Good morning. I hope that you're uh, starting off a good day today so far and um, just want to get you oriented here with a few announcements before we get too deep into it today. Uh, guys, don't forget we have a test on Thursday. Uh, so when you come in on Thursday, uh, you're going to have the whole class period to do the test. You may not need the whole time. You can leave early if you're done early. But I would always recommend uh, taking the time to check your work. Um, you know, it's easy to make goof ups with EROs and stuff like that. It's kind of good to get those things fixed up. So don't be in a rush. Try uh, your very best, of course, to, to do the best that you can uh, during that the test on Thursday. Uh, my... Um, Office hours the last couple of days have been pretty quiet. I assume that maybe means that you guys are finding that resources folder and just plowing through it on your own. Uh, if you have questions on it though, of course, or if I didn't explain something as well as you would have liked, uh, you're always welcome to talk to me. Don't forget that I have extra office hour every single day this week uh, up until our exam. Um, in particular, I'll have some hours tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow night, uh, both in Zoom and in person. Um, so feel free to drop in, uh, if, if you just, if you're having trouble with just motivating yourself for whatever reason, maybe you don't have a question for me, you're just having motivational issues. You can come hang out outside my office and we'll work, we'll work on our stuff together and, and try to be productive this week. So anyway, I'm happy to uh, help out with all of that. I won't drag you through the, uh, the canvas page again. It really hasn't changed very much. The only thing that uh, I did do. Uh, this morning, I posted the solutions to that extra credit quiz. Uh, I posted those into the midterm one resources folder. Um, I am actually going to be grading those extra credit quizzes myself. I'm not going to ask my grader to do that. I'll probably do it tonight. Uh, don't expect a lot of feedback on those. It, the problems were only worth one point. I'm either going to give you zero, a half a point, or one point, depending on approximately uh, how your solution looks. Uh, but I'm not going to make a lot of comments or feedback. I just don't have time for it. i got about 70 of those to grade. Uh, and we've got a test on Thursday, so I want to get it done really quickly. Uh, but if you have questions about that extra credit quiz, uh, of course, you can look in the uh, midterm one resources folder and look at the solutions that I uh, put in there uh, just this morning. So feel free to do that um, as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention... Um, this afternoon at four o'clock, um, this is just today, um, my SI leader is running a, he's going to focus, spend this entire uh, map 251B, I think it's what the name of the class, this is his one unit SI class that you don't have to be enrolled in. If you're interested in going to that, um, I believe, uh, so uh, this is an SI session and my SI leader has said this is going to be a midterm prep workshop. So he's going to probably do some practice problems or have you guys try some practice problems. And so you're welcome to attend that even if you're not enrolled in it, if you just want to get some extra practice with uh, my SI leader, whose name is Janda. He was here briefly to introduce himself, I think the first week of the semester. Uh, he is perhaps the best SI leader I have ever had. Uh, I've had a lot of them through the years. He's very engaged in what's going on. He attends my two o'clock class every single day, so he knows exactly what I'm covering. He took this class with me a few years ago, and so he's he knows what my exams are like. He knows the kind of questions he, that you're going to get asked. So if you are interested in that uh, this afternoon, feel free to, to drop in on that. I know there's a lot of resources, and you've got already the, the stuff I've put up in Canvas. You don't have to do everything, so don't feel like you have to go to, to this or do every single thing in the review packet, but just take it or leave it as much or as little as you think you can handle, and with the time you have, uh, I think that would be that would be great. Um, so anyway, so that's uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I don't remember, I think it's in uh, MH187. Is anybody here in that SI workshop? Is it 187? Okay, good. So I do have the room number correct. Um, so feel free to, to go to that uh, this afternoon if you're interested in it. 
Um, let's see, what else? The other thing is there is a homework assignment due tonight. Uh, homework number eight um, is due tonight. And I didn't uh, create a space to offer you to ask any questions on it yet, but I'm going to during the break today. If you've been working on it and you want to ask me anything from that assignment, um, you'll be able to do that. Or you can also come to my office hours today because I'll be around. Uh, when will I be around? <laughs> Pretty much from 530 until 10 o'clock with a little hour and a half dinner break about seven o'clock or so. So anyway, I'll have lots of time. You can uh, ask questions on that homework and I'll post the solutions to it um, last thing before I go home tonight. So you'll have all that stuff up there. Okay. Um, yeah, so that'll be it. Uh, we're gonna do a couple of group works today. I'm also going to kind of review a little bit of what we were doing last week and also foreshadow a little bit in the chapter four. Uh, I guess the last thing I'll say is I just want to remind you guys one more time that there will be, in addition to the extra credit quiz that you finished, most I think almost everybody did it, um, that you turned in yesterday for extra credit, there will also be extra credit after the midterm that will also be points that you can earn towards your uh, midterm, and that will be a video. Uh, all you have to do is watch the video and take notes on it. That's going to be for next, uh, this coming weekend. Uh, so you have, you'll, I'll... I'll have a deadline on that that'll be before next Tuesday's class. So just a heads up to be kind of on the on the lookout for that as well. Okay, any questions about any of that stuff? Okay, great. So on Thursday, we got the test. That's the big thing going on this week. Um, I thought maybe we could help ourselves out by reviewing a little bit of the stuff that uh, will be on the exam here. This is the uh, determinants material, and I've just overviewed again uh, why determinants are important, right? Up with determinants. We like determinants. Uh, we're associating a number with a matrix, right? Of course, it's only going to make sense for a square matrix. You can see here I have n by n size. Um, if the matrix is not a square size matrix, then you can't talk about determinants. You can't talk about inverses. None of that actually makes sense. But for a square matrix, we can use determinants to test for invertibility of that matrix. Will it have an inverse? So we just calculate the determinant. And as long as it's not zero, right, then the matrix is invertible. So that's kind of nice. It's a little bit of, it's reassuring to see that uh, the matrix will have an inverse before we launch into trying to find the inverse, it's nice to know if it's even going to have an inverse first. So that determinant uh, can help us uh, with that uh, question. Uh, once we know that we have an inverse for our matrix A, we can actually use determinants to find the inverse for A. So if we don't like doing a lot of elementary row operations, which is what we learned in chapter two for how to find the inverse of a matrix. Another alternative is completely based on determinants, namely the adjoint method, right? So we talked about this last week, the adjoint method for the inverse of a matrix. Guys, everything that's in a box on this board, you will definitely want to know for Thursday, right? So here's the formula for the A inverse. We take one over the determinant of A, right, which won't be zero, right? So the determinant will not be zero, so we're not dividing by zero, times the adjoint of A. And just to remind you here, the adjoint of A, uh, we practiced this last time, but just to remind you, it is the transpose of the matrix of cofactors, okay? So if you've been doing the homework for tonight, uh, you've been getting a good workout with some of these equations already, right? Um, so you take the matrix of cofactors, you transpose it, that's your adjoint. Okay, and then from there, uh, you just divide by the determinant of A. This is a scalar, a scalar multiplication into this adjoint matrix, and that gives you A inverse. Really nice way to get the inverse of a matrix um, without having to do a single ERO. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of nice. And then uh, the third application of determinants, uh, we we're kind of running short on time last week with, but I'm going to practice it with you now, is this a so-called Kramer's rule, right? Kramer's rule is a method for solving a linear system of equations. Now, of course, we have the old methods. Let's not forget the old methods, the Gaussian elimination method, where we 
write down A sharp and we bring the matrix into row echelon form and then we set up the uh, uh, the pivots. We circle the pivots and we just do back substitution, right? We, let's not forget that because again, Kramer's rule is not going to always work. If the determinant of A is equal to zero, Kramer's rule is not going to work. You cannot divide by zero. Or if the matrix is not a square size matrix, then Kramer's rule is not going to work. So let's not view this as somehow taking over all the earlier stuff that we learned. This is just a nice method that will sometimes work if we have an, an invertible matrix, capital A, as our coefficient matrix. And uh, I briefly wrote this formula down. I do need you to make sure you know it, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about this. The X of I's, these are actually the unknowns that make up this vector X here, right? So the vector X has slots like X1, X2, X3, and so on. If I want to know what one of those uh, unknowns is, right, I can just simply calculate it as a, as a ratio of two determinants, two numbers, right? Uh, the denominator, of course, is the good old determinant of A once again. And this thing in the numerator is the determinant of what I'm calling B sub I. Uh, so remember, I mentioned again, this was very much at the end of class last time. Uh, so let me remind you what B sub I is. This is the matrix capital A. So you just take the original coefficient matrix A with the ith column, right? The ith column replaced by the B vector. The B vector is the vector on the right-hand side of your, of your linear system here, okay? So I wrote that down on uh, Thursday last week, but then we didn't actually do an example of it. I know that if you've been, again, if you've been working on the homework that's due tonight, you've already seen some uh, Kramer's rule problems, but just in case, uh, I thought maybe we could do a warm up here to practice the Kramer's rules. We have a group, technically, we really haven't seen it uh, before. So they moved here. Just want to make sure you guys can see. Um, so here's a here's a nice little warm up problem. I have a system of equations here on the bottom of my board. Two x plus eight z plus w equals zero. Negative x plus y plus three z plus five w equals zero. Right. Then I have 2x plus 2y plus 6z minus w equals 0. And lastly, 3x plus z minus 4w equals 7. And I'm asking, and notice here, I'm not asking to solve the whole system for all of the unknowns. I'm only asking for what is z. It's kind of interesting. Uh, you have four unknowns there, but I'm only asking you to find one of them. That actually lends itself nicely to Kramer's rule assuming we can apply Kramer's rule, because Kramer's rule is, is a series of expressions to pick off the specific unknowns. So I can actually target in on the Z variable here, since that's the one that they're asking us to solve for. Okay, so I'd like to try this uh, warm-up problem. Um, would anybody like to suggest maybe what I might want to do first here? Yeah, get my matrix uh, set up here. Like I, I can see obviously that the capital A is showing up in pretty much everything. So let's see if we can write down the, the coefficient matrix capital A. So we would have a capital A equal to, so I'm, and I, here I'm not doing A sharp, I'm just going to do A. And on the left side, I have all the coefficients that I need to write down the matrix. So the first equation, the uh, coefficients are 2, 0, 8, and 1. And then on the second row, I have a negative 1, 1, 3, and 5. Yeah. And then on the third row, I have 2, 2, 6, and negative 1. And on the fourth row, I have 3, 0, 1, and negative 4. So that's my coefficient matrix, capital A. And then I might as well write down the B vector because I can see that the B vector is part of the problem that we're going to need, and the B vector is just the numbers that make up the right-hand side, and I can just draw them as a column uh, over here on the right. So that's the B vector. Okay. If we're going to be able to use Kramer's rule at all, uh, of course, as I've already talked about, the matrix has to have a non-zero determinant. 
Uh, I don't know if this matrix looks familiar to anybody, but I, of course, have rigged this to be a matrix that we have seen before. Uh, you may not remember, uh, but last Thursday, uh, I actually asked you to find, or we did as a problem, find the determinant of A. So we've actually done this already. So I'm just going to recall that for you. Uh, so recall from, this would be September 19th lecture, right? So just last week, um, the determinant of A uh, is equal to, as it turned out, it was negative 110. Um, I just uh, did that by using cofactor expansion. You might remember, see the second column has two zeros in it. So it's well set up to do expansion along column two. And we we did that last, last week, okay? So I'm just making my life a little easier here by recalling a matrix from that we've seen already. So we don't have to do another four by four determinant. Okay. Remember, guys, if I ask you to find the determinant of this matrix, you have a lot of things you can do. You can do cofactor expansion directly, just the way we did this last week. Or if there aren't enough zeros in the matrix already, we learned last week that we can do EROs. We can actually uh, bring more zeros into this matrix by doing elementary row operations. Uh, to turn it into at least uh, somewhat closer to being in what's called triangular form. So that we remember the, the determinant of a triangular matrix is just the product of the diagonal entries. So that's really easy. Uh, but anyway, um, I know I've only done a couple of examples of the full-blown cofactor expansion method, uh, but this was certainly one of them. And it's definitely something worth uh, making sure you know how to do. I probably would have a four by four matrix on next Thursday's test, because I don't just want um, everybody using the arrow method a hundred times. <laughs> it's just not that interesting. So be ready for a four by four matrix or or larger potentially. Okay. So anyway, but that's a, that's a good example to, to look at. Uh, and now if I want to figure out the Z variable, it says solve for Z, then uh, I've got my denominator here. And what is my I value? Uh, you see, I've got these notations of x of i, but in my system, I don't have x1, x2, x3, and so on. I have x, y, z, w. So which of the um, i values do you suppose we're going to use for the z? The third one, right? Yeah, Angela, exactly. The third, because if I just go in order, right? First variable, second variable, third variable, fourth variable. So the z variable is really the x3, right? So um, I'm going to calculate um, the determinant of what I will call B3, right? Uh, and this is the determinant of the matrix. So now we're going to remember how we create this matrix. It is the same as the matrix A, but the third column is going to be replaced by the B vector. Here's the B vector. So the third column is going to be replaced by the B vector. Everything else from the original matrix just stays the same. So I'll just fill in the rest of the matrix here again. So this is the Kramer's rule, guys. You take out the third column of capital A, and we're replacing it here, right, by the B vector. Okay, that looks pretty good so far. Um, is everybody with me? Now, uh, to do this determinant, does anybody, if we may as well practice. Th this is a matrix we have not done before. Uh, so it's a four by four matrix. Does anybody have a suggestion how to do that determinant right now? Uh, Nathan? Expand the third column. Let's expand that third column because of all the zeros that I see there, right? That's really a good idea. So how is, how is the notation for this, for this working? Remember, we're starting right here and we're gonna go down this column. So that's technically, a13, C13, plus A23, C23, plus A33, C33, plus A43, C43, right? That's the way the column notation would look. But the most important thing to realize is that A13 is zero, A23 is zero, and A33 is zero. Those are all zero. The only... Uh, expression we have to calculate is the last term. A43 is 7. And I also wanted to point out that 
do I have to do a sign change on this particular position? Remember my little plus minus, plus minus, plus minus alternating thing? That's an odd position in the matrix, right? Four plus three is odd. So there is a sign change. So instead of seven, I'm going to write minus seven times the determinant of, see if I can squeeze this down here, guys. I'm gonna cross off that row and column. I'm gonna make my three by three minor by taking the remaining rows and columns. So it's a three by three matrix. The first row is two, zero, one. Second row is negative one, one, five. And the third row is two, two, and negative one. So we're gonna get negative seven times this little three by three determinant right here. Am I going too fast? Following so far? Uh, of course, for three by three, we can just use the arrow method if we want. Um, I think I'm just going to tell you what it is because the arrow method is pretty basic at this point. It turns out it's going to come out to 26. Um, I'm sorry, negative 26. Got my minus sign. So it's going to be negative 26. I'll have you check that on your own if you are interested. But uh, the arrow method is very quickly becoming kind of just a routine thing. Uh, and then 26 times 7 is 182, I believe. So that's 182. So I've got the determinant of A, which is negative 110. I've got the determinant of what I'm calling B3, which is 182. And so therefore, let's just come over here. Z is 182. That's the determinant of B3 divided by the determinant of A, which is negative 110. And you can just leave answers like that. If you see something on the test that's just a fraction, uh, I'm not a stickler about putting things in lowest terms. I actually like it better that way because I can see the, the numbers where they came from in your work. So that's a perfectly good, good answer there. What do you think? Any questions on Kramer's rule, how that would work? Of course, I could have asked for X or for Y or for W instead. And I would have just had to remember to replace the 007 column in a different place, a different column instead, right? But it would be the same process. Chances are I wouldn't be asking you on a test to do that four times, right? That's why I would maybe ask for just one of the unknowns here. That would make a, a better test question. Uh, Audrey, do you have a question? Yeah, so if we have a problem that just says solve for Z and then the system of equations, and then we like we decide it's kind of short, we have to like test if it's. I guess like it would, it might not be invertible. So then you have to do something else. Um, that's true. So it could be this this could say solve for z, but then the matrix turned out not to be invertible. You'd figure that out pretty quickly when you did the determinant of a, and then you'd say, okay, I guess if the if the determinant is zero, then I cannot use Kramer's rule. So at that point, you would then have to put this the into a the augmented matrix and do Gaussian elimination. Okay. And in that case. You also, you would not be expecting a unique solution. You guys remember that from the invertible matrix theorem? If the coefficient matrix is invertible, then yeah, there's a unique choice for X, for Y, for Z, and for W. But the minute that the matrix is not invertible, now we learn from the invertible matrix theorem that we won't have a unique solution. Maybe, it will, maybe we will have no solution. <laughs> now that would not be a good test question. I'm not going to ask you to solve for Z if it's not possible to get a value for Z. Like that would not be something I would ask. I would have to phrase the, the problem differently. But it would be possible also to have infinitely many solutions. Because remember your system, every system has either no solutions, one solution, or infinitely many solutions. It's those three choices. But the one solution case occurs precisely if A is invertible. And if A is not invertible, then it's going to be one of the other two cases. Kind of making sense? It's definitely something uh, to, to go back to chapter two and kind of refresh your memory about those, those different cases. Okay. Any other questions? These are good points about Kramer's rule. So like if I ask you to solve for Z, it's kind of a a tip off to use Kramer's rule because you're only having to find one of the unknowns. And so you can just use this formula once. It's similar to the questions where it says, 
you know, find a particular entry of A inverse. Instead of finding the whole A inverse, maybe I only ask you to find, I don't know, the two, three entry of A inverse. So that's um, something that's well suited to, to the adjoint method. Right. So anyway, uh, just keep that in mind as you're studying a little bit. This is importance of determinants. Questions, comments? Are we all good? Great. Um, I would like to take a few minutes uh, before we, we're going to do some group work today. Finally going to get to the group work. But before we do that, um, I'm actually going to talk about uh, a fourth importance of determinants. You notice I have three things over here, but I'm going to mention a fourth thing. And I'm going to sort of preface this by saying that this little discussion here will not uh, be on the midterm this Thursday. So I'm actually kind of working a little bit ahead right now into chapter four when I talk about this, but it's, I think, a good time to do it. Um, we're kind of thinking about determinants right now, and so I think this would be a good a good thing. And I did write this down last week in the, in the big list, but what it's about here, the fourth point, is a geometric interpretation. So I would like to give you a quick little geometric interpretation to the determinant, okay? Specifically, I have a couple of points I'm going to make. I'll call these A and B um, to organize this a little bit. Um, the first one is if A is two by two. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go very specific on the size here. If the matrix is two by two, then the determinant of A actually has a, a geometric meaning. And what is that meaning? Uh, the determinant of A measures the area. That sounds like a geometry concept, right? The area of the parallelogram. Okay. This is about as geometric as it gets in math 250b. Not going to be too bad. The area of the parallelogram determined by the rows or columns, you can use either one, of the matrix of capital A. So, the determinant of A actually is a number, as we know, and that number is going to represent the area of a parallelogram. Now, I do have to keep in mind that the area of a uh, of a shape is always a positive number. And of course, we know that determinants can come out negative. So I'm going to do something here, guys. You're going to want to add this to your notes. Uh, technically, we better take the absolute value of this determinant, because if it comes out negative, I don't want to say that the area is negative something. Right. So I just make it positive by putting absolute value bars on that. Let me show you a quick uh, example of this. Uh, let's say we take A to be um, the two by two matrix. Uh, let's just have to make up some numbers here. How about uh, one, four, five, one, something like that. So we'll make a, a little two by two matrix here. And I'm actually going to interpret these as as row vectors. So you're going to see me use this notation a little bit more today of using vector notation. The rows of the matrix are going to be these vectors. So the first row is just, so V1 is just the vector 1, 4, and V2 is just the vector 5, 1. And I can draw, let, let's actually come up here then and draw this picture in the XY plane because it's talking about a parallelogram. So how is that parallelogram created? Well, it says it's determined by the rows of A. So the row first row vector is the vector 1, 4. So I can draw that vector here, right? I can make a vector right there. This would be, uh, I guess we'd call this one V1. All right, so V1 is just this vector, which is the point 1, 4. And then the second row is the... Uh, vector 5, 1. So I go come around along this way and I can build the second vector, which is V2, which is V2. Let me draw that a little bit better. 
this is V2 right here, uh, along that direction. And you see, guys, if I give you those two vectors, just those two vectors alone, it determines a parallelogram. Because what I can do is I can take the vector V2 and kind of redraw it up here. I'll draw it kind of with a dotted line. And then I can take V1 and I can redraw it over here like this. Yeah. So I'm just redrawing V1 and V2. This is sort of the definition of a parallelogram. And this area, this shaded area right in here, right? How much area is that? Well, this area is going to be equal to the determinant of A. Well, let me be clear, the absolute value of the determinant of A. What is the determinant of A on this uh, matrix here? This little two by two? Negative 19. negative 19, right? One times one minus four times five. It's just a two by two. So that's negative 19. So that's absolute value of negative 19, which gives me an area of 19. Great. So the uh, determinant can actually be useful for finding the area of a parallelogram. Okay. So that's one sort of geometric application of a determinant. Um, but there's, and, and to prove this, by the way, is a, an exercise in geometry uh, using uh, things that you probably would have seen before in calculus, uh, laws of sines and cosines and stuff like that, right triangles, so on and so forth. I'm not going to do it here. It's not really the point of 250B, but it's just something uh, to be aware of. Uh, uh, yes, Marco? Was this the vector space or is that something else? We're we're not to vector spaces yet, but we're heading in that direction very shortly. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, let me extend this to a three by three example. So I'm going to call this B. So the second uh, geometric interpretation would be the following. So if A is three by three, then the absolute value of the determinant of A, again, we'll take absolute value. So we want to make sure we get a positive number. Um, measures, what's the three-dimensional analog of area? Volume. volume. Very good. So this measures the volume of the, and does anybody know the three-dimensional analog of a parallelogram? Parallelopiped? It's a parallelopiped. Absolutely. Very good. So let's write that down. Parallelopiped, which for all intents and purposes is just a box. <laughs> it's basically just a, a, a box shaped thing that maybe has been, imagine a shoe box that's been kind of crushed in a certain direction. So it might not be just a perfectly rectangular box, but it could be like a crushed box. Um, so it's officially called a parallelopiped. And the rest of this is exactly the same as before, determined by the rows or columns of A. All right, so let's come back over here and we'll need to do an example of this as well. We'll take a three by three matrix and explore the geometric insight here as well. It's actually quite powerful, this determinant idea. By the way, guys, determinants are not going to go away uh, once we're done with chapter three. This is a really powerful tool that's going to continue to help us as we go along. So this is a nice example that I'm going to show you right now. Um, for this example, I'm going to uh, let capital A be the matrix one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine. Just going to make that three by three matrix. Okay. And again, um, I can do rows or columns. I think once again, I'm going to stick with rows. So the vector V1 is just the row vector on the first row. So one, two, three, right? And then the second row vector, which is V2, would be four, five, and six. And then the third row vector, which is V3, would be 7, 8, and 9. So we can make these three row vectors that um, are associated with the rows of the matrix A here. Okay? 
And we can ask what is the volume of the parallelopiped determined by those three vectors. So <clears throat> the volume of the parallelopiped determined by V1, V2, and V3 is, okay, so let's write it down. So volume equals, it's going to be the determinant of A. Well, the absolute value of the determinant of A. And um, this is a three by three matrix. So uh, of course our go-to method for this determinant would be, uh, what's it called? Arrow method, right? For a three by three, we use the arrow method. So I'm gonna kind of do these diagonals almost in my head now, one times five times nine, right? That's 45. And then the next diagonal is gonna be a two, a six and a seven, right? You can see that the seven will get moved over to here. So without recopying the first two columns, you can sort of visualize how that's gonna come out. Two times six times seven, that's 84. The next diagonal is three times four times eight, and that's uh, 96. And then I'm going to subtract diagonals going the other way. Seven times five times three, that's uh, 105, I believe. And then the next diagonal over is eight times six times one, which would be 48. And then the next diagonal over would be nine times four times two, which is 72. So there's your arrow method. Uh, you might notice this is for the first time. I did it without recopying the first two columns. And if you start to get a little more confident with the arrow method, you'll realize that you can probably figure out which numbers to be multiplying for each of the diagonals. It's, it's not wrong to, of course, to keep redrawing those first two columns again and doing it the old way. Uh, that's still the same way I'm doing it. I'm just doing it, I'm being a little lazy, not recopying the first two columns. These are the numbers we're gonna get. Has anybody calculated that yet? What'd you get? Zero. Oh, I got zero. That's the same thing I got. That's actually zero, as it turns out. The volume of this parallel pipet is zero. Interesting. <laughs> this means a, a lot of things, right? It means the matrix is not invertible. It does not have rank three. We cannot use Kramer's rule. We cannot use the adjoint method. Like everything is goes bad now, right? This matrix is not invertible. But now we have this fourth application, this geometric interpretation, somehow the volume is zero. What does that tell you about this parallelopiped that's supposed to have a volume determined by this calculation? If a parallelopiped has a volume of zero, what does that tell you about it? Audrey, do you have an idea? Is it somehow like in the coordinate plane, it's canceling out, like some of the volume is positive, some is negative? Um, it's not like how integrals work, where, you know, if there's a curve that's above the x-axis and below the x-axis, it's kind of canceling out. I, I'm just asking here, if I have a, I'm telling you it's a box, but it has a volume of zero. What does that tell you? Like, does that mean it's a line? Uh, close. It's a Say it again. It's a plane. It is a plane. This, uh, th these three vectors determine a completely crushed parallelopiped. It just means that there's no volume to it. There's no height to it. All three of these vectors. So this means that V1, V2, and V3 all lie in a single plane. It is a fully crushed parallelopiped. <laughs> it is fully crushed. There's nothing to it. And actually, this is, so what I'm basically <laughs> saying, if I wanted to have a picture of this, what I'm basically saying is, okay, maybe you have this vector V1 that looks like that, and then maybe you have this vector here, V2, that looks like that. Now, those two vectors alone already sort of determine some kind of a plane here, right? They sort of make a plane. I mean, you can 
you can see that if I, if I just take this vector right there and I take this vector right there, right? And I look at, well, sort of what do they determine? They determine the, the top of this table, which is a plane, right? They're sitting in that plane and they kind of determine that plane. But what we're saying here, my friends, is that V3 is not creating a three-dimensional box at all. Rather, it is actually inside of that same plane again. It is actually in that same plane. So that you have no height to this parallel pipe. It is completely crushed so that it has a volume of zero. I can actually express V3 in terms of V1 and V2. You can't always do that. You can't always do that. If I give you 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, right? You, there's no way of writing 0, 0, 1 as somehow a combination of 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0. You can't do that. But here, we can. We can. In fact, maybe we've already seen how to do it. You see how to do it here, guys? Look at this. V3. V3 is actually equal to 2V2 minus V1. I'm going to let you stare at that while I erase the board, and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. If we double the second vector and then subtract the first vector from it, uh, yeah, that's right. If we double the second vector and then subtract the first vector from that, we will get the third vector. <laughs> you see that? Guys, take a look here. What's 2v2? 2v2 is 8 10, 12. If I double the second vector, and then if I subtract one, two, three from that, I'll be down to seven, eight, nine, which is the third vector, which is the third vector. And so in fact, what we have here is a what's called a linear dependency among these vectors. I can rewrite this. Let's put a, let's kind of emphasize this one here. Or if I want, I can rewrite it. V1 minus 2V2 plus V3, that is adding up to zero, <laughs> right? Those three vectors are uh, in a relationship here. There is a relationship between them. Another way to, to think of it, of course, is if you take the first and third vectors and add them together just the first and third ones only. If you add the first vector to the third vector, you'll get 8, 10, 12, which is exactly double of the second vector. So the, these three vectors are dependent on each other. They are related to each other. And it's exactly for that reason that this parallel of pi bed has no volume to it. <laughs> it's completely crushed. The, the third vector, the V3 vector, was already sort of expressible in the plane of the first two vectors. Okay, that which is sometimes the case and sometimes not the case. Sometimes the case and sometimes not the case. So I am going to, uh, with that sort of setup as a motivation, I'm going to give you a couple of definitions. Again, this will not be on the midterm for Thursday, but I'm actually talking about I've actually moved, believe it or not, I've moved into chapter four already <laughs> by talking about um, forming vectors and making these expressions that look like this. This is actually kind of what chapter four is going to be all about. So I'm going to make a definition here. OK, so we'll take a few notes on this for today. Uh, and I think this will also help when you're watching my extra credit video this weekend to have sort of seen some of this notation already. Okay, so here's a definition. Given vectors, let's say we have V1 and V2 and V3, and we could have any number of vectors. Let's say we have N of them up to Vn. What I'm going to discuss here for a moment, if, if I can, is the concept of a linear combination of those vectors. So a linear combination, right? This is the phrase we want to start talking about here, the, a linear combination is an expression 
of the form, it is an expression of the form. So here we go. It's some constant C1, scalar multiplying V1, plus a constant C2, scalar multiplying V2, and dot, 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 plus all the way to the last term, which is Cn, scalar multiplying Vn. This is called a linear combination. That is called a linear combination. So uh, for example, a good example of it is the thing we have right here on the top of the board, uh, V1 minus 2V2 plus V3. That's an example of a linear combination. You have vectors with um, scalars in front of them, and you're adding those terms together. Of course, a minus sign uh, is fine. It just means that the scalar is a negative 2 in this case. Okay, So we can create these so-called linear combinations of vectors. Like that's basically what we're doing. And so actually what we're saying in this, in this example above, uh, not only do we have this, we, we can also say uh, things like V3 is a linear combination of V1 and V2. I can write V3 by making a suitable choice of C1, well, C1 times V1 plus C2 times V2, right? So let's just come back in the notes and add that to our little uh, observation here about V3. So V3 is a linear combination, right? V3 is a linear combination of V1 and V2. Sorry, I know that's a little bit low on my board there, but hopefully you can read that okay. V3 is a linear combination of V1 and V2. In this example, V1, V2, and V3, these are vectors that should be pretty familiar to you. These are vectors in the usual three-dimensional Euclidean space. You would have spent the entire Math 250A uh, talking about vectors that live in R3, right? Your, your Euclidean space of R3, okay? So uh, when you're watching my video this coming weekend, you're going to see that we're going to drastically abstract all of that. We're going to start allowing our vectors to be other things than what you traditionally think of as like physics vectors or calculus vectors. We're actually going to be able to make anything we want into a collection of vectors. It could be types of fruit that you buy at the grocery store, or it could be functions as vectors, or it could be polynomials, a bunch of things. So that's all that's all coming for you this weekend to, to, to watch. Uh, it's a very abstract but powerful idea of something called a vector space, which is what Marco was just referencing a few minutes ago. Uh, it's where we're going in chapter four. Is everybody with me so far? So you can take a handful of vectors and you can just throw constants in front of them and any expression of that form is called a linear combination. That's the definition here. Yeah, question. Um, can you say like V1 is a linear combination of Two, yeah, we could resolve this equation for any of the three vectors. So if I wanted, I could think of V1 as being a linear combination of V2 and V3. Or I could think of V2 as being a linear combination of V1 and V3. Right. So that is definitely possible. And then when you set it up at the beginning, is there anything like how do we know if you, oh V3 is kind of like the like V1 and V2 are the setup and then V3 is the one that kind of makes it have no volume words. Actually, left. that is totally arbitrary. Like I just did it in order because I saw the first, I just decided to start with V1 and V2 and then draw V3, but you okay. wouldn't have to have um, arrived at that observation that way. Okay. You could have said, I'm going to start by drawing V1 and V3, and then I'm going to recognize that V2 is what half of the sum of V1 and V3. Okay. Something like that. Yeah, that would also be totally good. Um, so what we're going to end up doing, guys, uh, I'm going to make another definition here. 
Uh, what we're going to end up doing is some of this weird thing. We're actually going to take these linear combinations and we're going to form all possible linear combinations. So this is the definition. The set of all possible linear combinations of a set of vectors, let's say V1 and V2 and dot, 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 up to Vn, the set of all possible linear combinations of those is called, it's called the span. It is called the span of those vectors, V1, comma, V2, and dot, 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 up to Vn. It's called the span of those vectors. So what I'm talking about here is the notation is we just put the vectors into a list here, V1, comma, V2, up to Vn, and we write the word span in front of it. We write the word span in front of it. Okay. So again, I want to go back to this example that we had over here. Um, and what I want to point out is that if we take the span of the vector 1, 2, 3 with the vector 4, 5, 6 and with the vector 7, 8, 9, if we take that span, now what we're doing, again, what does this mean? This means that we take all possible linear combinations of V1, V2, and V3. Okay, we take all possible linear combinations of them. So, it, you know, for example, by the way, some of these constants could be zero. They could all be zero except for the first one. So one of the linear combinations that's in this span is actually the vector one, two, three itself. You just put a one in front of the first vector and put zeros in front of all the others. That'll give you V1, right? And then I could do the same thing if I chose C1 to be 0 and C2 to be 1 and C3 to be 0. That would be this vector. And that's also one of my possible linear combinations. It belongs in the span. And so does 7, 8, 9. In other words, guys, what I'm saying is included in this span are the three vectors themselves, right? They are part of what you have. And in addition to the three vectors themselves, you have all possible linear combinations of those vectors. So you'll have 2v1 or negative v1, 3v2, 5v3, all of those, but then you're allowed to add them too. <laughs> you're actually allowed to add them. And what this comes out to be, somebody mentioned it a couple of minutes ago, physically what this is, is it is a plane. It is a plane in R3 that contains um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, 8, 9. I'm just curious. Uh, do you think that you'd be able to write the equation of that plane? I have to drag you back to 250A, don't I? Did they ever ask you to do this? Here's three points. Now tell me the equation of the plane that contains those three points. Does that sound like a familiar problem? <laughs> yeah, so you know, you can essentially what you do is you form vectors between the points. And then uh, you, you ultimately, to write the equation of a plane, you have to have what's called a normal vector to that plane. And to get that normal vector, uh, you take a cross product, <laughs> cross product of two vectors that are in the plane. So we could actually write the equation of this plane. Uh, so the equation <laughs> of the plane can be uh, derived from having these three points. Guys, if I wasn't teaching 250B, I promise I would be teaching 250A. I really like 250A. I just never get to teach it because they always have me teaching this class. Uh, but this is like my second favorite 
class is 250A um, because it's got some really cool applications to it. Um, anyway, what we could do is, well, actually I have to, I have to make this actually even a little easier than you think, because we don't really need to subtract these points to make vectors here, because there is another vector that is automatically always in the span of anything. So let's go back to this definition again. The span, what is it again? All possible linear combinations of the vectors. That's all expressions of this form. Nobody ever said that these C values couldn't be zero. And in fact, what if they were all zero? What if C1 was zero? And what if C2 was zero? And what if C3 was zero, right? If we put zeros in front of all of the vectors, what would you end up with? The zero vector, wouldn't you? If you take zero times one, two, three, plus zero times four, five, six, plus zero times seven, eight, nine, you will get zero, 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 okay? So, you know, we could point out that this plane also contains zero, 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 because that is a linear combination of the three given vectors. In fact, any time you take a span, of a collection of vectors, one of the things that you will build as a linear combination, one of the expressions that you will um, realize is the so-called zero vector. Because if you simply choose all of the constants to be zero, you have to have this zero vector in there. Make sense? So how do I how do I get my my normal vector here? So let's go ahead and talk about that. The normal vector. Uh, sometimes we use an N for that. Uh, we just have to take a cross product. This is as close to teaching uh, Math 250A as I get to be. Uh, we take the cross product of two vectors that are in the plane. And so the vector 1, 2, 3 is in the plane, and so is the vector 4, 5, 6. Was that him, Dano? Yeah. So does this imply that the span will never be empty? That's true. That's true, the span will never be empty because the zero vector will always be in there. That's right, absolutely true. Uh, in fact, the span is usually pretty big because after all, you're taking all possible linear combinations. There's a lot of vectors there. Uh, yeah, so guys here, let's just remember, you guys remember how to do the cross product? This IJK thing? Did they show it to you this way? In 250A? Do you realize this is just a three by three determinant and we actually could use the arrow method? <laughs> I bet they didn't tell you that in 250A, right? That it, we didn't learn about determinants in 250A, but you absolutely can do that, right? You you, we could just cofactor expand the first row, right? So you have I times this little two by two, a two times six minus three times five, that's negative three times I, right? And then Sign change, don't forget, this is a, a negative entry in the matrix. I take six minus 12, right? So I cross off that row and column. Six minus 12 is negative six, but I'm gonna change it to a positive six because that's a, sort of an odd position in the matrix. And then we go plus, we get to the K entry, we have one times five minus four times eight, which is negative three. So that's minus three K. And this is the IJK notation for it, but we could also just write it as a traditional vector with three slots, which would be negative three comma six comma negative three. That would be it. Pretty neat, huh? You guys remember this? So, so there's your normal vector. And then how do you write down the equation? See, to write the equation of the plane, I need to have the normal vector and I need to have any point that's in the plane. Well, I've got four of them. Uh, I'm just going to pick 0, 0, 0, because it's the nicest one. So my plane, the equation of my plane here, my friends, is negative 3x plus 6y minus 3z equals 0. So I know that maybe some of that isn't totally on the tip of your tongue from Math 250A, but that's how you actually can get the equation of the plane. Pretty sweet. Um, this plane should contain all three of these vectors. Is the vector one, two, three 
going to work? If I put x equals 1, y equals 2, z equals 3, I better get 0. If I put x equals 4, y equals 5, z equals 6, I better get 0. Right? If I put x equals 7, y equals 8, and z equals 9, I better get 0. Right? This is a plane that contains all three of those row vectors uh, of this supposed parallelopiped, which has been crushed down into a volume 0 shape, which is exactly the, um, the uh, plane that we've described right here. Pretty nice. It's pretty nice. Um, we are going to have a ton of stuff to say about spans of vectors uh, in chapter four. Believe it or not, most of this discussion we've just been having uh, really is already in section 4.4. <laughs> so I, I jumped ahead just a little bit here uh, to give you a preview of, of where we're going with this. But I think for now, um, especially since this won't be on the uh, tests on Thursday. I don't want to clutter your thoughts too much with all of this new material. That'll be for the weekend. I'll let you watch the, the video about this um, or the setup for this. And then uh, next week on Tuesday, we're going to come right back in and I'll, I'll try to recap this a little bit. Questions or comments here? I don't know that that guy who wrote the book down, with Down with Determinants and Linear Algebra Done Right, um, he must not have been thinking about all this stuff. Because honestly, we, we have been, this all started with, let's find the determinant of this matrix. And we came up with zero. And then we interpreted that as meaning that those row vectors actually lie in a plane. And we can find the equation of the plane. And we're connecting back between Math 250B back to Math 250A again. It's a pretty nice way to connect those subjects together a little bit. Guys, let's take a 10 minute break. I'm going to give you some fresh air time. Uh, during the break, if you've got any questions on the homework that's due tonight, we can put those on the sideboard. Uh, and then we'll also do some group work when we come back from the break. So at about 10 after 11, we'll pick things up from there. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I think. What section was it? It was two or three points to Yes, I think that's another point. I mean, basically what I'm saying. Yeah. It was the So 52 minutes tomorrow. Yes. And 80 and then Hey, what's up? On a scale of like one to five, how similar would you say the practice exams are like in things that we need to talk about? 
Um, I would okay. definitely do the practice. I've not written your test yet. Yeah. Okay. So I can't tell you as far as that goes, but I can tell you that um, that, that would be a very high priority thing to look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Oh, yeah, I have a question for. Hey. For the chapter one review questions, the ones that have all the different types of yeah, questions, yeah, are there some hyperbolic? Um, ignore them if there are, but there, the, basically the, anything of that nature. So there were there are some other types of differential equations besides linear, separable, Bernoulli, homogeneous. So if you see one that you're like, yeah, I don't recognize that. That's nothing familiar to me. Then what you can do is just pass it by and go on. Yeah, because like I get the like I get to the point where it's a hyperbolic idea. Don't worry about that. Yeah, I, I th those problems were. I decided to put them on the list just in case people want to practice classifying them. But in terms of trying to actually solve them, it's it would take you a long time to go through all that. I was don't feel you them. were trying to do them all. Well, that's extra brownie points for you because I I could do that. <laughs> with with the amount of free time I have. Um, so, but yeah, that's um, going above and beyond. Okay. She also says that this and then this project. There are some that are nice, but if you get like the little Crayola like cylinder sticks, I just want to assume that stuff. Um, I know it is. It's just being hot, but there was no hot. No, you're like, I wasn't hot. I'm not funny. Are you going to FI today? Oh, it's not. It's like the last actual video. I'm kind of, kind of confused about what it is. Because I know they have a lender. They do. Yeah. Oh, about the SI? There's a I, limit. A lot of people showed up and then they couldn't. They had a limit. Because of the fire codes? Yeah, the same Did somebody kick them out? Yeah, Janda has to. Oh, really? So, uh, I well, he, I thought maybe there's not very many people coming because so it's really, because it's the only two things to be for the entire school. They, so, like, Borgette's class are also, well, they're also in there. Oh, gosh. So, they merged everybody. Maybe he can, like, um, if he has it on a handout, take you guys outside somewhere or something. It's just a nice day. 
Is this the grass? So then there's no white. But then there's no white words. That's the trouble with that. Yeah. yeah. I didn't really. He keeps he keeps asking me to advertise his thing, and I was like, oh, do you not have very many people coming? Or, but. Like, thank you yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. So, like, so. I had to go because I'm not enrolled. I'll, I'll have to talk to him about that. I didn't realize, realize it's an issue. Maybe he'll have, does he usually have like a handout? <laughs> Practice some problems. So it would be nice if we could at least pass that out to everyone. Maybe I can, maybe I can see whether if he does have handouts that if I could get those put up onto the canvas page as well. So. I'm not on it. I forgot to ask. All right, guys, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, pick up now with the second half of our class this morning. Um, what I wanted to do here, uh, if I could with you for a second, is this is uh, one of your homework problems for tonight that ended up on the side board over there. Um, it looks like it's the only one. Um, so I just wanted to point out, uh, this is a good problem for us to do because it's <laughs> similar to problems that I might ask you on Thursday, which is, uh, here's a matrix A, and let's suppose that I ask you to find not the entire A inverse, but just one particular entry of A inverse. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna find, just gonna do this problem real quick. I'm gonna find the three one entry of A inverse. Now, of course, we could just find the whole A inverse matrix and then grab off the, the three one entry to report the answer. But the idea here is to try to be efficient and focus only on this one particular entry that we're trying to find. And so this is a question like this is well suited to which method do you think we're gonna use? Adjoint method, exactly. We're gonna use this adjoint method for A inverse. So I'll start by writing down the formula again, since it's super important. The inverse of A is just one over the determinant of A times the adjoint of A. And I'll go one step further and remind you also here that the adjoint of A is just the transpose of the matrix of cofactors, okay? So obviously I need to find the determinant of the matrix. Um, this is just a three by three. Does, does anybody know what the determinant of this three by three happened to come out to be? Seven. Let's just check it with the arrow method. Zero plus zero plus two, and then minus negative three, minus negative two, and minus zero. If we work that all out, it is seven. Okay, I did the arrow method very fast in my head almost. Okay, so you don't have to go that fast. Uh, in fact, you want to be careful. There's double negatives here that are easy to, to mix up. Um, but anyway, that's that's what you should have. Okay, so that's going to go in the denominator. And then we're only interested in the 3, 1 entry of this, um, you know, transpose of the matrix of cofactors. I'm only interested in the 3, 1 entry of that, which actually means which cofactor am I really interested in? One, three. One, the 1, 3 cofactor. Exactly. It's just going to be the 1, 3 cofactor. And do I need to do sign changes on the 1, 3 position of the matrix? No. We go back and remember our little plus minus plus minus diagram, right? We can see that in the 1, 3 position, there's no minus sign. Uh, adjustment. So in fact, this is the same as the one three minor. So I'm just going to take the one three minor. Here's the one three position here. I cross off that row and column and I just do my little two by two determinant. Negative two minus three is negative five. This should be negative five. 
And again, we do not change the sign of that. We just leave it as negative five. And so my answer, uh, my answer here then becomes negative five divided by seven. That's the three one entry of A inverse. We find the one three cofactor, right? So the three one entry of the adjoint is just the one three cofactor of the of this matrix. So that's what I was finding right here. I cross off row one, column three, this little two by two sub matrix, right? That determinant is negative five. That's what I'm putting right here. I take that one three cofactor and no matter what it is, I'm always dividing by the determinant of A. Every single entry will always have that determinant of A on the bottom of it. And so we had gotten seven for that part. So we just end up making this fraction negative five over seven. Pretty easy, right? In the sample test, you're going to see a, I do a question almost exactly like this, except with a four by four matrix. Um, so I think a four by four matrix is also fine because if I only ask you for one entry, then you're only finding one determinant here and one cofactor here. And that's not too much work. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Any questions on that? Pretty good sense. Okay, well, I have a ton of office hours, as you know, uh, later today. If you're still working on the homework that's due tonight, feel free to, to uh, ask me questions later. I will post the solutions to today's homework. Uh, last thing before I go home tonight, which will be midnight or so, probably, like usual. Um, so feel free to uh, check out the answers by tomorrow uh, if, you, if you have any. You're probably not going to get this homework actually graded by Thursday, unless my grader is really on the ball. He's been pretty good, but... Um, there's a chance it won't get graded by Thursday. So check out my solutions if, if you need to, or just come talk to me directly about it. Okay, what I'd like to do next, I hand it out. I hope everybody got a copy of that handout that um, I, during the break, I kind of went around and put, put them on your tables. I would like to have you get together with two or three people and there's a whiteboard in the back, there's room on the side over there and anywhere up here in the front, and I'd like to have you guys uh, talk through the problems that you see there on group work number four, which is, uh, this is a little bit of back to chapter two, uh, but I'm going to turn you loose and see uh, see if you, you and your partner mates can figure out uh, how to do these problems. I'll come around and uh, check out how you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're doing all the are we just like picking one? Can you start with problem? Yeah. Then, um, can also work in so how find space it's your choice yeah find a that's that's more than once. There's more than one. Yeah, sure. was you just talking about it. Yeah. Oh, oh sure. I see. Okay, guys, no pressure, but I've got my uh, the cameras are rolling here. For anybody who misses class, I can watch the little bit. So yeah. make sure there's uh, no mistakes. <laughs> Yeah. 
So the fastest way to do that the very start room is I see a one right here. Most likely the first stuff with the I guess you can do it the other way, or you can leave it like that. You can leave it like that. Eight or eight two. You're multiplying the third row by the second row. Negative I mean, right here, I guess you can just hold the one. I might have got it. Oh, you'll be right to the other one. Oh, you'll be right to the other one. You'll be in my head. If you did two steps at the same time, like here, just the six space, like right underneath, you can make it slide. Yeah. 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 Guys, let's get those ones into the upper left corner. That's the key thing on these EROs. First step should always be to get a one into the upper left corner. You're getting these for large. So this is not invertible. So it's not vertical. We can't do anything. We can't do anything. We can't do anything. We can't do anything. So what do we have to go here? EROs. And what is the way that you're going to get a one into the upper left hand corner? Fastest and the easiest. Excellent. Great. Good job. Oh, yeah. Done, guys. Oh, I don't like it. No solution. That is what I got. I like it. Nicely done. Very good. So, what do we can do? Take this That's over here. The next one. And there should be an eraser. Yeah, you can erase it. Yeah, go ahead. Anybody need help? Last time we erased it, like, but he told us he was in the Last time I was in the big man. Six. It's just Oh, and it's not the like, it's only three by four. Okay, the same Oh, no, this is two by two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Oh, I see. Anybody need help? Oh, 
that's it. That was like Zero is zero. Oh, Thank you. Oops. Uh, <laughs> it's more like it was uh, testing triceps there. Okay. <laughs> so I'm using a lot of my shoulders, so this should be interesting. Oh, yeah, I had a feeling this would be all chapter two, so actually I had a feeling like oh this is not look like oh yeah, you gotta be provided. Yeah. Well, these sets a couple too, like if you the fix very like solid profile and it's probably gonna be okay. It's more conducive with my what is so far so good, although I think we could just leave it so this is there's nothing so change the idea is nice well this would be the what i would have done from here this is just to get in the habit of the best it no, for reason I No, 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 Oh, yeah, yeah, that would be negative. That would be negative. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 
This one only has a rank of one. This one has a rank of two. Great. Great. Anybody need help? Everyone's is great. All correct. So, why do you to get a one in the top row. Oh, yeah, man. So, right here, I have permuted one in there. And what you did here is okay, but you're making extra steps. That's my bad. Okay. Okay. No worries. I do think that you're, everything is correct here, but you're doing more, too many work. So, it, it's just not every extra step you do, you have a chance to make a mistake. So, it's right. best to go as efficient as you can. But for now, it's just easy. Like, I say, just go ahead and do it. I have to do it. I have to do it. Two AB isn't the same as two AB. Yes. Okay, so I could I just So here, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I want to like like a bunch of days. Oh, okay. Two T minus. Oh yeah, sorry. Two T minus. 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 Mm. <laughs> It makes some rashes, doesn't it? Yeah. It makes the sugar. Yeah, I think that is. Jack 
The statement was supposed to be that they are not gone. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Correct. Oh, so well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Well, I'm going to do this. 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 I'm going to Oh, okay, no, that's more just plus. It's a little funny about that. It's a So much that's the work. So we're going to do this. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
The matrix on the right has three rows. So it actually does have three strengths. This makes the one in the So that's that's exactly the the matrix and more rows, it has to have larger Right, right, exactly. Not your your example there really shows it nicely. Oh, yeah, that's the kind of thing you can start to say. Something is not good. Anybody need help? Even me. Yeah, so you, I assume you took this times this. Thank you. Time that. You have spoiled it out, all this stuff. But let's use each of signs to connect all the steps. And it's fine, a little detail. Um, everything's canceling, right? Except you end up with this minus this one, double that. So it's just by n, and now that's going to have to show us that it's going to be two things. When you multiply them together, you get the identity matrix, and it means they are inverses of the yeah, we don't do Yes, in the beginning, it's like, wait, how is it multiplying across? Now, that makes sense. Like, okay, yeah. One whole oh, side. And then you do one Oh, oh there's part B. Um, so I'm going to give you guys uh, another thing to play with. And you can skip 1A because we did it in the confession. You can probably skip just now the follow two directly if you wanted to. Sure. Oh, this one is like series eight. We said not to do problem. Well, oh, he said don't do problem one or do problem two. He said not to do one. What are you doing? He's doing uh, four zero. Oh, thing. Oh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, then, okay. So, hey, 
So like determining A is negative two. So you're going to find that the next thing you're going to write. We have to we have to give my like like show the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so see what you can do, right? Or do you think arrow methods? Okay, are we doing? Oh, no, no, no. Oh. Yeah, to Get oh. back to the. Damn, that's a You just. Are you the race of Tom? Uh, you would like for the one thing that make the A plus B? Yeah. And then you made the last one. The last one. What did you say, Malcolm? I think it's the B. Okay. Now it's so uh, it just makes it. So, um, oh, I thought we were going to go from like, well, we want to do that. Yeah, we do, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, do I start from A or do I start from A? Yeah. Start from A, huh? Yeah. And then get to the first one. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Uh, I want you to get problems two. Just two and three. Don't worry about number one because we did number one. And you can just start closing your chat. Hey guys, uh, Alex or Isaac, I'm sorry. You guys can skip to problem two. Oh, I forgot to take. Number one was mostly on the homework already. Yeah, just go to problem two. Yeah, that'd be fine. Because you're only going to have like four minutes, but I bet you can get almost this whole number done in four minutes. Yeah. If you want to, you can. Okay. If it's helpful, you can just do it doesn't do anything. Depends on whether you're going forward through your work or backward through your work. These problems are mostly going forward through your work. Awesome. um, it's the columns that don't have notes. So the turn will be negative eight, then corresponds. And then the second half. Yeah, exactly. So this is actually the same thing as it says the columns that have the leading ones correspond to the And that's not the leading ones that correspond to the leading variables. It's the um, undivided. Let me just yeah, let me just yeah, it's a it's a word salad of talking that makes it confusing. It's very easy to show you. So I would find all the variables here. These three are the and this is the three. That's not hard. This one, Wait, wait. 
Hey guys, um, can I get everybody's attention for just a second? Because we're just about out of time. I only have like a minute left or so. You should have picked up two group works from me, which are group works four and five. Um, I know that most of you didn't totally get finished with all of this. That's totally okay. But what I'd recommend that you do um, in the next couple of days is just go into Canvas. There's a folder that has the solutions to all of these. So I'd encourage you, if you didn't quite get a chance to speak about all of them today, just spend a little time on your own just going through them. It won't take you very long. Uh, and if you get it's stuck like, on anything from these new works or don't understand the solutions, you can always come ask me. Okay. With that in mind, uh, I want to wish you all the best with your studying the next couple of days. I'll be around. I'm here to help. I want you guys to do well. Uh, and anything I can do, I'll do. But that's it for today. And I'll see you on Thursday, if not before. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody get both of the group works. You're uh, number four. Oh, right. Yeah, straight. Yeah, just a blank on there, and then also a separate folder. If you have trouble finding anything, just let me know. That's always uh, what you have to just learn the hard way. I think I remember the first time I was learning arrows. I was making my life so so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I mean, technically, it should still work out. It's just it's faster if you. Yeah, because it takes long. It takes I know. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you're picking up some good, some good points. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This one is just a clean. This one is just a Yeah, you're doing them. Yeah, those, those are pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. And there's like all the same.